please welcome to the stage Chris Marientis with Surefire Local. Thank you. Hey everybody, I hope this um, this talk is going to probably tie together a lot of the things. It's kind of interesting. Every entrepreneur has a story. And this is going to tie together a lot of different stories because we've gone through the outsourcing, the, um, you know, uh, how to get culture right, how to get leadership right, and all those things. So hopefully you'll get something out of this. Um, so the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about how we bootstrapped our company from 2010, starting with a managed services company and then evolved to a SaaS company. It allowed us to keep control of the company and have a majority of the company. And right now, we're actually sitting at about 26 million in ARR. Um, in doing that, we had to really think about how we had to change leadership over time and the culture of the company because it's really different having a managed services leadership group and having a SaaS leadership group. And I learned that the hard way, and I'll share some of those lessons I learned. And then how we thought about capital. Um, we really didn't raise any capital except for myself and a few other folks putting in some money until 2016. You could see where the business took off. This is the reason why Nathan wanted me to talk. You could see that spike in 21 and 22. But the key thing I'm going to talk to you about is what it took to set the company up to be able to do that. Because I tried to do that at different periods of time and it never worked. And some of the lessons I learned to try to get there. So what we're gonna to learn today is, um, or let me tell you about what we do. We're a local marketing cloud for professional services type companies like contractors, attorneys, um, home services type companies. So we built really the Adobe marketing cloud for the specific use case of local marketing and delivering that at a price point that our customers could afford and in an ease of use that they could, they could use it. What we've really become is a big data company. And you'll start to see that at the end when we start to put together all the different data sources and how we use those. So our story started when I was, um, I was a CEO of two venture-backed companies I was brought in to help some founding entrepreneurs that needed some adult supervision. And I learned two things out of doing that. Number one, never do that again because you end up not really controlling the destiny of the company. And number two, um, I realized how venture capital works. And at my stage in my career, in my life, I didn't want to be the one in 10 that works because they're going to do is give you a pile of money and then they're going to tell you go fast and they want you to either fail fast or keep on piling in more money and take away ownership. And that's the issue that I saw. So I started this company with the idea I wanted to create a real business. It started with a book I wrote. And the reason why I wrote that was in honor of my dad. My dad was an HVAC contractor. And I saw how technology could really change the game and give back control of marketing to these entrepreneurs. And they didn't have to rely on agencies that were not very transparent and not really honest. And, and then or knit together a bunch of point solutions. So from that, we started a scaled managed services company because people were asking for help on implementing that plan we put together, the system we put together. That system is still the DNA of the SaaS platform that we created. It really just automates all those things that we put together in that system. Around 2014, APIs were becoming developed enough that we could actually create that Adobe-like cloud that I was talking about. Sketched that out, put in a couple of million dollars, just a few of us, to do that. And then started to test that with our own customer support people. We called them coaches in those days because we were a managed services company. And what we saw is our gross margins starting to go up because we're able to do a lot of the work in a more automated way, be able to do reporting easier to our customers. And uh, we saw a lot of benefits to that. Uh, so when you scale with technology, it takes human error out and it gives you easier ways to implement things. Around 2017, we got that software mature enough that we said, let's give this to our customers and let's test the assumption that the, you know, SMBs will actually use software, not only use the software, but use 
all the different pieces of the software because we were all in one. We had a lot of different pieces. Will they really get that idea? When we launched it to our customers in 2017, we saw adoption month over month just continue to go up and it was going up with all the different pieces of the functionality that we provided to them. We knew we were onto something. We learned a lot from that and then we said, let's launch the next generation of this software and leapfrog from where we thought we were. And we did that in 2019 and it was clearly the best product in the industry. Clearly the best product in the industry. But as we tried to start to, to now shift to selling software, my leadership team in sales, in customer support, in marketing, really wasn't able to make that shift with us. And I knew that was super apparent. So in 2020, I uh, started thinking about new leadership and brought in um, someone by the name of Mike Pierce who had four different scale opportunities, at scale opportunities in selling in the SM, into the SMB space. And had a really different approach than what I was at that time uh, doing. And uh, the rest is history in terms of our growth. So what this you know, playbook sort of consists of, and, and I'm thinking about this word at executive level, is number one, you know, the idea of committing to a, a process. And that commitment means spending some money on the enablement of that process, not only in talent, but also in technology and also in, um, you know, in, in uh, like leadership thinking about how to implement that process. And you might be wrong. Like we had, we were committed to a process before. It was just the wrong process. And that's why we weren't growing the way we wanted to. Secondly, I knew we had to have a different culture. We were moving to a transaction, more of a transactional sales model. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but that transactional sales model requires super high energy, really granular data at the, uh, at, at the um, salesman level, so you really know what they're doing, so you could train them, support them, understand you know, and, and be, have prediction about what your next month's gonna look like based on the output of what they're doing. And then you know, next, we really switched from a inbound model. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know a whole lot about SaaS, so I read predictive revenue like probably most of you guys did in the room and said, gee, I'm gonna commit to that model. And I did that for three or four years and it wasn't working. That was primarily inbound, SDR, multiple steps, advertising a lot in Facebook. And, and our, our customer acquisition costs were fairly high. We had a high a, a, uh, ASP, but it still was super high for what we were doing. And then Mike came in and brought in this transactional model that was really outbound first. So today about 30% of our revenue is from inbound, we're still doing inbound, but outbound creates a predictability of revenue um, if you do it right. And if you have the right types of technology, right kinds of management and leadership in that. So we have, we're a very, very KPI driven company at this point. I have my KPIs I do weekly with my executive team, but for the sales uh, leadership, their, their KPIs look more like this on the outbound side. And it's really around starting with dials, you know, demo sets, you know, you know uh, dials to demo sets, demo sets, held demos, win rate, MRR. And by really looking at those on a micro level, and then even more so by team, by vertical we're going after, it gives you a lot of rich data to help you better understand how your revenue is gonna shape up in the next month or two, but also where you need to spend time and focus with your sales organization. So it's super important that you have the infrastructure to be able to do something like that. So the next section I'm gonna talk about is, um, is about leadership and culture. Um, so when we started this transition and to bring in new, uh, new, brought in new leadership, you know, in my, our, our philosophy on this is you can't take your new leadership and go into a conference room and, you know, whiteboard, what do we want our culture to be? It's, it's not authentic and it's not gonna be something that's gonna be bought into by your people. 
What we ended up doing is we did a survey of all the people in our company. And we said, we'd like you to describe in words all the good things you think about the Surefire culture and all the bad things that you think about the Surefire culture. And, you know, sort of like uh, I, I, the analogy to this is like when you're on a diet, you don't want to focus on eating. So we didn't want to focus on the bad things. We want everybody focused on, you know, working towards behaviors that are the good parts of our culture. And I'll just walk you through. We, we ended up, you know, sort of putting all these ideas into five sort of pillars of our culture. One is driven by purpose. Our purpose is really around helping small business owners create wealth. They are getting ripped off by agencies and they've got, they're overwhelmed, confused, pissed off most of the time because they really don't understand this new world of marketing. So we wanted to make it super easy for them to understand it and how to be successful in it. And that is our mission, that's our quest. So we're all, you know, the people who come here have that same purpose. And we make it clear in the interviewing process all these different things that we expect. The second thing is this idea of keeping it real. Some people call it radical transparency, radical clarity, right? But the idea is to have engagement up and down the company. And that's the way you really great, create great results, right? If the more people engage, the better results you're gonna have. Everyone needs to feel like they're able to have a say, not a say, but comment and freely discuss some of the things that we're doing and hopefully add to those things. The, the next one is connected to liver. You know, in this you know, a world of distributed workforces and not having an office everybody goes to, it's super important to have people form connections, not only within their department, but across functions. So we're really intentional and deliberate through physical events, through technology, acknowledgements, all hands, things like that, to make sure people feel like they're connected to each other because then they can have those transparent conversations. And then empathy is really key to really win. If, uh, having some empathy for the other people in your organization, what they're dealing with, helps you better uh, communicate and communicate in a way where it's going to be a positive uh, development between the two people. And then never settle. We're a company that never settles. We, we are always looking to get better by the evening that we were in the, in the morning. We've done that with our technology. We do that with sales. We do that with everything in the company. We also align the executive team to be um, streamlined so that we could be built for speed. So um, we have, uh, we have two offices here in the States. We also own and operate a company in Manila uh, that uh, does a lot of the help desk support and engineering support for the company. But we've got uh, our president, Mike Pierce, that drives all the customer facing organization. That's the biggest part of the organization that we have. He also runs people operations. That's probably the most underrated part of our organization I really thought of before. But now looking at it in hindsight, it was the single best decision we made to bring a really strong people operations person. And then you'll see the effect that it had on the company. And then we have CFO and, and uh, CTO uh, separately with their organizations. And the result of all that is we won Inc. Best Workplaces this year, Glassdoor 4.4. Our employee net promoter score globally is a plus 74. Um, we're a remote first model and we have world-class benefits that our head of people operations was able to get by having someone just focused on that. The last part of this talk I'm gonna give is about capital. I know, um, you know, it's a big focus for Nathan here. We are, we're not venture funded, um, but we do have a debt capital that we raised once we thought it was the right time to do it. And that's the key, is understanding the right timing to raise debt capital, because you get yourself in serious trouble raising debt capital too early. So, you know, right now, we're, uh, eight, you know, 22, about 18 million in bookings, 19 million in bookings, We'll end this year about 30 million in ARR. Um, but we really raised our first 
debt capital in 2016, it was only a million dollars. But that was when, if you remember, we were just about to launch our platform to customers. And we knew we needed to grow our sales force to start to amp up the velocity a little bit of our, of our platform sales. And it was uh, really done with a venture bank. So it's fairly, uh, fairly good terms and pretty low cost for what we did. And you could see we got a little bit of a spike in bookings when we did that. Today, we have 11.5 million in debt, and that was done in a couple of tranches. The, the first big tranche of about uh, four and a half million was done in uh, 2019 when we launched the second version of our platform. And I knew we had to make a big bet on new leadership, and I needed to get the money to do that or we would still just keep growing 20, 25% a year. We're growing now about 75, 80% a year. Um, so that's when we started the Austin office. Now our company has more people in Austin than our headquarters up in the DC metro market. So the, the, the key lesson I'd share with you is, you don't wanna bet the ranch with debt capital unless you're using that money to grow. To give you a sense is we, I, I 5 x the value of my company. So some people said, you're taking that, that venture debt, it's gonna be really expensive for you, right? I mean, you're paying sometimes all in 16, 17%. But when you think about the valuation in three years of my company and what we've done, it really was super efficient way to do it. The other thing we were able to invest in, you know, we broke things, like the last speaker was talking about from Pendo. We, so we forexed our sales in, in really months, four or five months. And you can imagine when you do that and you have a customer success team that's not used to that velocity, you could break a lot of things. So we realized we had to start to get really systems and data um, uh, sophistication in our, in our company. So we built an infrastructure stack that I think would right now would be one of the most sophisticated in our industry. We have a service desk that now helps us manage all the cases that come in from our customers, whether it be tickets, phone calls, whatever it might be, and escalate things really quickly and triage them really quickly between our Manila help desk and our US um, customer success people. We have omni-channel communication for our customers, so they can reach us anytime, anywhere through voice, chat, text, email, and a bot that we launched. We also connected all these systems, including our marketing cloud, with you know, uh, you know, voice to text, so we get all that data in from all the phone calls we do with customers and all the other data. And it's super powerful. I'll show you some examples of that in a second. And then we were able to start a marketplace in our platform where now all of our, uh, our, uh, our, our service providers, we don't want to be in the service business, are able to hook into this and get the benefit of all this information about our customers as well. I'm not gonna walk you through this, but it gives you an idea of the complexity of all the different systems feeding you know, our platform right now. So we, this is why we've become really a big data company. This data is super powerful for our customers to give them insights about where they could get their best bang for their buck in marketing spend and ROI, but super powerful for us because it creates predictive models of customers that might be ready to churn. And we're, by the way, we're, we're probably not even 50% through implementing all this. It's all stood up and going, but we're not even through implementing all of it. One of the partners I want to highlight here is a partner called Involve.ai. And what they do is they simply ingest all the data that you could give them. You know, through APIs. And they've got data scientists that then create really sophisticated models that start to look at predictive churn, like in the next two to three months. And it allows you and your customer success team to really start to get ahead of that. You, in effect, I start to feel like I know more about my customer's mindset relative to their relationship with us than they do or before they do. And it's super cool. Then we feed that information into an application called Churn Zero, so our customer success people, again, narrow that down into Churn Zero, 
unpack what that customer is doing and find ways we can get that customer on a happy path. And we could also do automation around that. So we could do pop-up messages, emails, um, you know, in-app types of messages in mobile or desktop so that we start to try to move them to happy path and answer all their questions. So Churn Zero ends up becoming a playbook for our customer success people that helps them get that customer on the, on the happy path. And the results of that have been gross in that churn or, or gross net retention that's going up and to the right. And we're in a SMB space, which is really tough to get a positive, um, you know, NRR, but we feel we're on course to get at least a neutral NRR by Q1 next year, leveraging all these tools. And what's really neat about our business is, and with all this data now that we've got, you, can, you know, we've, we've uh, evolved from a managed services company to now a technology company, we brought different uh, customers on with a different brand promise at different times. So now we're able to sort customers by time period to take a look at how they behave differently. And you could see why they did because of the brand promise that we were selling our, 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 our application at that time. But what's really interesting is the new customers, meaning brought on from 2020 forward, those cohorts are doing incredibly well and are at 2.5% gross churn. And we're starting to get towards 1% net churn with those new cohorts. And that's because our, our velocity is so much higher now, becoming a much bigger book piece of our book of business. So to wind up, what I talked to you about here is the idea of bootstrapping to retain control of your company. We're, we're at a stage now when we're gonna do a private equity deal or strategic. And you know that's gonna probably be somewhere in the 125 to 150 million range. And I still own most of the company. So that makes me super happy. So debt could be a really great instrument at the right time to give you that control and also the better payout when you're done. Um, Establishing a strong culture and leadership is critical to be able to enable when you do these pivots or when you do these evolutions of your company, you really need to be able to do that, um, have a strong leadership. And then raise capital at the right time. And I think that is a great instrument when you feel comfortable that you could add, the, kind of add water and it'll grow. That's when debt becomes a, a, a big opportunity for you. Thanks.